Greetings, fellow saint. By virtue of your viewing, it would show that you are seeking the truth just as I am, and I am grateful for your time. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit as interpreted in the Trinity, even though also a point of contention in the general professing Christian world, is even more so these days a topical issue in Seventh-day Adventist circles. As I unwaveringly acknowledge Seventh-day Adventism to be God's truth for the last days, I know that the infallible resources of this faith, namely the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, will bring out a definite answer on this issue. I am only here to seek out the truth prayerfully, because God changes not, Malachi 3.6, and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13.8 Today's study will focus specifically on the Bible, what it says about the Holy Spirit, and those themes within the sacred word which influence how we understand the Holy Spirit. Occasional quotes from the spirit of prophecy will be used to support or make plainer certain things the Bible says on this issue. So before we begin, I would invite you to pray with me as we ask the Lord for well-needed divine guidance. Let us pray. Father our God, we humbly beseech your Spirit that will lead into all truth. Your Son says that as an earthly father giveth good gifts unto his children, so even more you, our Heavenly Father, will give us the Holy Spirit if we only ask. Even if we may not be clear about the Holy Spirit at this present time, that mysterious Spirit is still needed now for the truth to eventually impress our hearts. But there are conditions, meekness. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. We must put self with all its prejudices and presuppositions aside, and trust in the plain thus saith the Lord. Then we can have confidence that you will lead. And so, please be with this sincere effort to investigate the truth as we ask all these things humbly. And thank you by faith for answered prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now as we begin, there are some guideposts from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that should place us in the right direction to understand this topic. The first guidepost is to take the Bible as a whole. And we'll gain support from that from Isaiah 28 verses 9 and 10. It reads, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand a doctrine? Them that are weaned from milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So who are those who will understand the Bible? Those who acknowledge its teachings one upon another or connected with each other as many strings bound together form a firm cord. It is when you harmonize the related scriptures found in different parts of the word that you can find the irrefutable truth. This also comes out in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17. And it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scripture, not some of it, is there to instruct us unto perfect understanding and righteousness. Support in taking the Bible as a whole also comes from the spirit of prophecy. As we read now from Education, the book Education, by Ellen G. White, page 123 to 124. She says this, But the most valuable teaching of the Bible is not to be gained by occasional or disconnected study. Its great system of truth is not so presented as to be discerned by the hasty or careless reader. Many of its treasures lie far beneath the surface and can be a 
obtained only by diligent research and continuous effort. The truths that go to make up the great whole must be searched out and gathered up, here a little and there a little. When thus searched out and brought together, they will be found to be perfectly fitted to one another. Each gospel is a supplement to the others, every prophecy an explanation of another every truth a development of some other truth as you see there she also quotes from isaiah 28 as we mentioned a while ago another reliable support comes from one of the founders of the seventh day adventist faith even though he didn't eventually become a seventh day adventist he was an adventist though the prominent leader william miller and this is from the book Sketches of the Christian Life and Public Labors of William Miller by James White. This is from page 49. This is from his Principles of Interpretation. He says, To understand a doctrine, bring all the scriptures together on the subject you wish to know, then let every word have its proper influence. And, if you can form your theory without a contradiction, you cannot be in error. The second guidepost which, is, which will help us to reach unto the undeniable truth about this topic is taking the Bible as it reads. And support from that comes from Proverbs chapter 30 verses 5 and 6. It says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So the word of God is authentic and tried. You can trust its plain statements as they are written, not adding to them nor subtracting from them. Also we can look in Psalm 119 verse 160. It says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. So the Bible is true from its inception, and none of its teachings need adjustment. We can look in also one more support in Numbers, Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19. And it says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Well, that's a rhetorical question to show that God will never take back anything he has laid down in his word what he has promised it is final and we can trust it as he says it plainly we can find support from this not only from the bible but from the spirit of prophecy let's look at great controversy page 599 Ellen White says here the truths most plainly revealed in the bible have been involved in doubt and darkness by learned men who with a pretense of great wisdom teach that the scriptures have a mystical, a secret spiritual meaning not apparent in the language employed. These men are false teachers. It was to such a class that Jesus declared, Ye know not the scriptures, and neither the power of God. The language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning, unless a symbol or figure is employed. Christ has given the promise, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. If men would but take the Bible as it reads, if there were no false teachers to mislead and confuse their minds, a work would be accomplished that would make angels glad, and that would bring into the fold of Christ thousands upon thousands who are now wandering in error. And further support comes once again from William Miller in his Principles of Interpretation. And we'll be going in the we have two more principles to go and we'll be referring to William Miller and the Spirit of Prophecy as support to show that the Bible supplements these principles and guideposts that we're setting forth here. So let us look at page 50 of the same book, Sketches of the Christian Life and Public Labors of William Miller. He says here, if a word makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the simple laws of nature, it is to be understood literally, if not figuratively. So even Mr. Miller agrees with the spirit of prophecy that the Bible should be understood as it is. 
And let me just, just in case anyone may have doubts about William Miller, you have to remember that God had worked through specifically William Miller to bring about the Great Advent Movement in the 1830s up to 1844. The Millerite Movement, led by William Miller, was instrumental in building up the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And his teachings were carried over those things that were correct into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So when, when I'm quoting from Mr. Miller, it is a reliable source. And remember, even this book that we're quoting from was published through the authorship of James White, who was president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists during this period. So this is authentic stuff. The third guidepost we should look at to understand this Trinity issue is understanding Bible language and context. And support from that biblically comes from Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 to 4 and 9 and 11. It says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest, liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, verse 9, then shalt thou understand righteousness, and judgment, and equity, yea, every good path. Verse 11, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. And when we look at chapter 3 of that same book and verse 21, it says here, My son, let not them depart from thine eyes, keep sound wisdom and discretion. So we're told when we seek and by faith are willing to be taught by God himself of his word, we shall learn of his ways and apply such balanced principles to gain a correct understanding of the scriptures. We see the words judgment, equity, understanding, discretion, sound wisdom being juxtaposed in these verses. So it's suggesting to us that the intellect, the sensibilities of man will be exercised in order to properly understand the scriptures. And we'll get more support from that in Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. And it says here, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we see here that one can rightly or even wrongly divide or explain the scriptures, but the wisdom or discretion gained from an ever-growing knowledge of God through constant study of the scriptures will make all the difference. The different usages of, of language and context found in the Bible can many times reveal the thing we believe the passage was saying was not actually as we had thought. Another proof of this from the Bible is 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. It says here, And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in, his, in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So in this context, the word rest, W-R-E-S-T, here means to pervert. Therefore, we must be learned in the school of the of Bible religion and stable in our judgment and temperament in order to learn and maintain the truth as it is in the Bible. Returning back again to Sketches of the Christian Life and Public Labors of William Miller, page 50, his Principles of Interpretation. This one says, Figures sometimes have two or more different significations as day is used in a figurative sense to represent three different periods of time, namely first, indefinite, that's in Ecclesiastes 7.14, second, definite, a day for a year, Ezekiel 4.6, and third, a day for a thousand years, Second Peter 3.8. The right construction will harmonize with the Bible and make good sense, 
other constructions will not. So we see here that the Bible can mean different things in different places and we have to understand the context, exercise that discretion through the humble teaching of the Lord. And the, la the last proof that we can use here is from Great Controversy, page 521. And Ellen White says here, In order to sustain erroneous doctrines or unchristian practices, some will seize upon passages of scripture separated from the context, perhaps quoting half of a single verse as proving their point, when the remaining portion would show the meaning to be quite the opposite. With the cunning of the serpent, they entrench themselves behind disconnected utterances construed to suit their carnal desires. Thus do many willfully pervert the word of God. So she's showing the danger of not dividing, rightly dividing the word of truth, the danger of not acknowledging context that will bring forth the truths of the Bible. And the fourth guidepost that will help us is the weight of evidence guidepost. And support from that comes from first, we'll use John chapter 10 verses 23 to 27 says here, And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him, and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, to tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So one of the biggest problems Jesus had with the Jews was their stubbornness. Despite he had given them numerous evidences of his divinity through the many miracles wrought in the name of his Father, they still wanted something to satisfy their selfish unbelief. But Jesus would not yield to their demands. He had given sufficient evidence for them to accept the truth. What they lacked was faith. And as Hebrews 11 verse 6 tells us, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So in order for us to truly show whether we love God, we must believe in him implicitly by the weight of evidence he provides. Romans 1 verse 20 also supports this idea of the weight of evidence should be all we need to make a decision for God. It says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So God does not have to appear right in front of us in his divine form for us to have a formidable reason to believe. As a matter of fact, his divine form is a consuming fire to sinful humanity. So we would die immediately. So even with the evidence of his creation alone, we are without excuse. We go back once again to William Miller. And, it, and it's wonderful to see this harmony playing out from the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, and one of the great pioneers of the Advent faith. So we're on page 51. Of the same book from William Miller. It says here, the most important rule of all is that you must have faith. It must be a faith that requires a sacrifice. And if tried, would give up the dearest object on earth, the world and all its desires, character, living, occupation, friends, home, comforts, and worldly honors. If any of these should hinder our believing any part of God's word, it would show our faith to be in vain. Nor can we ever believe so long as one of these motives lies lurking in our heart. We must believe that God will never forfeit his word. And we can have confidence that he who takes notice of the sparrow's fall and numbers the hairs of our head will guard the translation of his own word and throw a barrier around it and prevent those who sincerely trust in God and put implicit confidence in his word from erring far from the truth. Ellen White in Testimonies, Volume 3, page 255, says it even more clearly for us. 
Satan has ability to suggest doubts and to devise objections to the pointed testimony that God sends. And many think it a virtue, a mark of intelligence in them, to be unbelieving and to question and quibble. Those who desire to doubt will have plenty of room. God does not pro propose to remove all occasion for unbelief. He gives evidence, which must be carefully investigated with a humble mind and a teachable spirit. And all should decide from the weight of evidence. Perfect. I'm sure you can't argue with that principle. And, you know, basically that last guidepost really flows into the last thing that we should always do when we're trying to find out truth is to have faith. As the Bible is our standard, we know that there is only one truth. We get support from that from Psalm 119 verse 89. It says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So there is no debate about God's word in heaven. It stands like an immovable pillar always. One truth. Why shouldn't we believe then that with an honest inspection of this same word, with the humble petition for his enlightenment, God's enlightenment, will we not find the one truth? And when we find sufficient evidence of the uniform position of the Bible on a teaching, we can also say it is settled on earth. And we can reverently conclude our search by acknowledging Isaiah 8 and verse 20. It says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So there we go. So you can agree with these principles. These principles are Bible-based, Spirit of Prophecy-based, Children of God-based. This is a reliable principles to get to this truth because it will be of no avail if we try to sectionalize this or to polarize this issue. One side or whichever side takes their text from here and one takes their text from there and we're just talking past one another. If we can agree on these principles and realize that they are supported and will help us to find the truth, then we can trust in them and see what we find. Well, friend in Christ, let us begin in the fear of God.